In the 1680s, Zach loved playing football with his friends. On one Friday afternoon, Zach and his friends played a very intense match in a town in Lincolnshire. Despite their efforts, Zach and his team lost the game. Exhausted and filled with disappointment, Zach decided to rest underneath a large tree. He sat there for some time, pondering about the possible mistakes he may have made during the match, which led to their defeat. A couple of moments later, Zach dozed off. Waking up from a daydream, Zach realized that he was staring up at the tree. And then a moment later, he realized that there was an apple very, very close to him. And he therefore concluded that he was exhausted because he was hungry. However, before he got the chance to stand up and grab it, the apple snapped off his branch and plummeted down towards him. Because of his tiredness and fatigue, Zack was too slow to react, and so the apple landed right on his nose. Zack cried out in agony and cursed the apple. But after a moment, Zack realized that he was cursing an apple, an apple, for falling on his head. He found his own ridiculousness amusing, and so he began to laugh. But after about a minute, he began to wonder who was to blame for inflicting all that pain on his nose, if not the apple. Was it a religious entity? No. When Zach got home, he spent hours scouring the Bible for clues and explanations for this mystery. But he found nothing. But then who was it? Or what was it? Zach was an inquisitive man, hungry for knowledge, always eager to know why things happened. And so the question of why the apple fell from the tree did not slip through his hands like sand, but remained at the back of his mind like a woodpecker trapped in a wooden cage. After hours and days of thought, Zach came up with the idea of a force pulling the apple to the ground. This force was later to be known as gravity, and Zack was later to be known as Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, along with Michael Faraday, Galileo Galilei, and René Descartes, were a few of the many great minds of the Renaissance and Industrial Revolution periods. Before the 17th century, People mainly investigated the realm of science for war purposes, as everyone was at each other's throats and they would do anything that would give them an advantage over the rest. These advantages generally being more sophisticated and powerful weaponry. The 17th century saw a great advancement in science. But these advancements were not propelled by war, but by scientific curiosity instead. Newton questioned why the apple fell from the tree. Fahrenheit created the first mercury in glass thermometer. And Galileo discovered sunspots and was the first to, to see craters on the moon. Ever since the creation of the steam engine in 1698, which marked the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, scientific discoveries have been somewhat different. more minuscule, such as the discovery of electrons, more dependent on electricity, as if the discovery by Thomas Edison in 1879 was the key to further scientific exploration, and more recently, less materialistic. And I'll explain what I mean, uh, what I mean by that in a bit. The fact that science is changing, and the way we look at science is changing, should be viewed in a positive light as we are not taking the wrong path on the journey of knowledge, we are just innovating differently. Technology, created decades ago, has given many youths the opportunity to become thinkers and scientific explorers, as we are living in a generation of innovation, but a new type of innovation. 
I previously said that our science is becoming less materialistic. That is because we are delving into the depths of the brain. Modern science is more psychological and perhaps to an extent philosophical. An obvious example of this is the research going into AI, artificial intelligence, what it means to create a consciousness and whether it's even possible. In this generation, and the future generations to come, we learn differently. I had a conversation with my father not so long ago about how I am learning differently compared to how he was when he was my age. Now, I didn't quite understand what he was trying to say at first, so he told me this. Imagine you were in a library and you have been asked to learn 50 books. Sounds hard, right? But it's fairly straightforward. You read them, you understand them, and then you memorize them. He said that that is how he learned 50 years ago. Then he said, you, my son, have been asked to learn 50 million books. But what you must do is learn the 50 ways to learn all these 50 million books. In this generation, we are being taught to learn how to learn. A concept so convoluted and obscure that not even the great minds of the old scientific eras could have devised this way of innovating. One way we learn through AI is with Google, but not just Google. If I wanted to know, say, the year of, bir uh, the year of birth of Isaac Newton, I could look it up on Google, on my, <clears throat> on my phone, or my laptop. But I'm not limited to just that. I could also ask Siri, in which year was Isaac Newton born? Isaac Newton was born January 4th, 1643. 1643. Just like that. Over the course of my life, I learned these ways of learning information like this. Another thing we have learned through AI is navigation. In this generation, if you want to get from town A to town B, you know that you can use Google Maps, or your phone's default map app, or your car's built-in GPS system, or you can buy a sat-nav and connect it to your car. At some point in your life, you have discovered by yourself or been taught by others these methods of getting from point A to point B. And I encourage this. I believe that learning how to learn will skyrocket our understanding of the world. I believe that this and future generations should embrace this innovation. However, in 50, 20, even 10 years time, we may see even more changes to our innovations. When I become my father's age, what will I tell my children? Perhaps something similar to what he told me, right? But we don't know. We can't know. Only time will tell us. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that today's innovators are smarter than, say, the 17th century innovators. No, far from that. In fact, many of the real geniuses that have ever existed lived in that era. And we still have not yet acknowledged the true depth of their intelligence. The impact these men and women had on our understanding of the world will last for as long as humans say, but why? Thank you.